So welcome back uh, to the last session of this <coughs> three days of exciting time for us. Uh, so today we are going to have this uh, some type of discussion session on this uh, very interesting connection between Mera, which Supi described this morning, and to ads cft correspondence. In fact, somebody asked me what is ads cft Well, I'm going to expand that. Uh, so. Since we have a strong string theory group, we wanted to take advantage and uh, two colleagues, Bala and Steve Avery, will tell about ADS CFT correspondence. They will take each about 15 minutes or maybe more. And then there will be questions and uh, discussions. There is no you know, it's a very informal thing. So please uh, stop the speaker if you have any questions. Uh, nothing is a, you know, a stupid question. Uh, I'm sure I will start with the first question. So Bala. So, Steve, are you going to use the projector or blackboard? Blackboard. Oh. Apply the projector. So uh, I'm supposed to give a short introduction to uh, ADS CFT. So it will be very qualitative, uh, quick description. So if you have, if you need more details, feel free to ask. And whatever I can provide on the spot, I'll provide. I don't have a prepared uh, talk as such, so I can deviate. So uh, the basic idea about ADS CFT uh, comes out of string theory, and there's a uh, basic idea in string theory that you can relate closed strings and open strings. Uh, and so I'll just draw some pictures for that. So if you have, this is a closed string. That's an open string. So this represents the propagation of a closed string. And this kind of a wave function represents the propagation of an open string. And uh, the other ingredient is that the closed string, the massless states of the closed string contains gravity, I hope you can read, contains gravity. And the massless states of the open string contain Yang mills. Okay. So I'm just giving you a very uh, sort of one minute motivation why uh, there should be a duality between gravity and uh, field theories. And the idea is if you look at this diagram now, uh, you can think of this as a closed string propagating like that. Alternatively, if you think of that as your uh, space direction, this as your time, then this is, looks like an open string propagating in a loop. Okay. So uh, there is a duality intrinsic to this uh, to the string that says clothes, closed strings and open strings are somehow dual descriptions of the same. So same diagram can be viewed as an open string loop or as a closed string tree. Okay. So that motivates us to think about a duality between theories with gravity and theories with uh, matter, which is Yang Mills. So that's the point number one. Uh, so when you say this, yeah. this is all in the same spatial dimension loop. Where yes, is, yes. Closed strings are different. Right. Like yeah. three dimensions are strings. That's right. So it's in, the, in the case of string theories, there's a critical dimension, which is for superstring theories, it's 10 dimensions. For bosonic strings, it's 26. Uh, but that is a different issue because you can compactify and so on. But the point is, there is a basic uh, relation there between open strings and closed strings, and therefore Yang Mills and gravity. So there's, it's not very surprising from the string theory point of view. That's the first point. Uh, I think, uh, no, I, I don't know. I don't know if you'd go that far. There, there are alternate descriptions of a theory. So if you start with a theory of just closed strings, you're going to end up with 
bound states like D brains and then you will have open strings. But a, a given process can be computed entirely in terms of open strings or in terms of closed strings. <coughs> so that is one. Then a, mo a more uh, to come closer to ADS safety there is a field theory uh, history uh, uh, you know in the 70s uh, Tuft came up with this idea of large n Yang mills. He studied large n Yang mills and he showed that um, the perturbation series can be written in terms of uh, sums over Riemann surfaces and therefore he speculated that large n Yang mills should somehow look like a string theory. Uh, but the, what that string was was never clarified. I mean, it just looked like a some uh, mathematically it looked like a string perturbation series. Uh, the second development about large n was uh, Gutten's idea that somehow in large n, if you take large n uh, field theories, Yang Mills theories, so we now talk about SUN Yang Mills. So the gauge field A mu, there are n squared minus one of them. So you, when you have a large number of degrees of freedom, you expect some kind of a uh, classical description and what Witten said was he proposed that there should be some kind of a master field, what he called a master field, um, so that when you calculate correlation functions of gauge invariant operators, if you if you if you have if you force it to the full, full functional integral, then you don't expect it to factorize. But if you if, if for some reason uh, this configuration is dominated by one configuration then you expect the correlations to factorize as a, as a like in a classical theory. So he proposed that there should be some master field configuration uh, which would allow you to calculate leading 1 over n, I mean the leading 1 over, uh, leading in 1 over n terms of correlators. This was also never properly realized in a practical way. No one ever found a master field or anything like that. It's a master field of AMU. Of AMU, oh, yeah. yeah. So his, his idea was a master field of AMU. Oh yeah, once you have an AMU, you can calculate F mu nu. No, but no one ever found found anything. I mean, it was never no one ever. It was a theoretical argument that since correlations factorize, that means your functional integral is as if there's just one field con contributing to that, and that, that carries all the effects of the functional. So is that a saddle point? Of, uh, it's some yeah, it's some kind of a saddle point. Yeah. So some mean field, yeah. So I'm looking for patterns of the field. That's right, yeah. So, but anyway, the point is it never materialized. But what I want to say is that both these, the idea of the string, uh, yang, a string description of the angles and the master field description of the angles seems to have become materially realized in this ADS CFT conjecture. The only thing is it's not SU and Yang mills, but supersymmetric Yang mills. Uh, in fact, in particular, the theory they had was, uh, where it was studied was the thing with uh, this n is different from that n, four supersymmetries. So for this theory, both these ideas are realized, but the novel thing is that the, this is a four-dimensional, if you take a four-dimensional supersymmetric Yang Mills theory, the string that describes that theory lives in five dimensions. So it was not what a Tooft was hoping for, it's not a four-dimensional string, but a five-dimensional string. And uh, and that five dimensions turns out to be an anti dissiter space. Okay, so the string description description of uh, supersymmetric Yang mills is an anti dissiter five dimensional space. So you have a so you have four dimensional Yang mills. So I'll draw a picture here. So this is, let's say, my uh, M4. This is 3 plus 1 dimensional Minkowski space. And you have the A mu and the matter fields sitting here. And what, what was discovered is that you have a extra dimension in this dimension, which you can call R. And the string that you're talking about somehow lives in this uh, five dimensions. And not only that, uh, there's a very specific metric for this five dimensions, which is, so if I write down the metric, it's something like uh, 
some approximation. So this is your metric for the four-dimensional Minkowski space. R is the radial dimension. So R is 0. So you notice that it's dr squared by r squared. So as r goes to 0, this, this blows up. So in r equals 0 is very far away. Okay. So this is a space. This is called anti dissiter space. And the string lives in this dimension. Not only that, um, the master field idea also comes in. Because if you want to calculate correlators, for instance, of uh, suppose I want to calculate the correlator of a Wilson loop. So we're talking about a gauge invariant object. So this is a Wilson loop. So this is e to the power of a. So I have this operator in the Yang-Mills theory, and I want to calculate its expectation value. So the way you're supposed to do it is to calculate a classical surface uh, with this has the boundary. So this is over some C. So this is C. So you calculate a classical surface with this C as the boundary, whose area you minimize because you're given the geometry, you can calculate the area in this metric. You minimize that area. So this, in some sense, gives you, it's like the master field configuration, which will give you the expectation value of the Wilson loop. So if you evaluate the area of this extremal string configuration uh, surface, you'll you will be able to get the expectation value of that Wilson loop. Okay? So yeah, surface in the area space yeah. is a master field. Well, the master field is. That's one manifestation of the master field. So for this particular case, the master field you can think of as that, that configuration of the string in this background. So the whole, so, the, so now I'm going to be more precise a little. Uh, so we're talking about string theory in ADS5. Okay? One of the modes of the string itself is a graviton. So we have a non-trivial background metric, which is ADS. So that itself is a background. You can think of the metric as some condensate of strings if you want. Uh, and you have this, this particular example, it's a, a surface. So the whole thing, you have a classical gravity background with a classical uh, surface. And that gives you uh, the expectation value of this thing in the quantum theory. So this uh, duality, in some sense, realizes those two ideas. So what I'm going to do next is to make the statement of the conjecture precise. Write down what the conjecture is. But, so uh, yeah. having done this, New, the light of new development. Yeah. Can you say what is the master field? Well, the master field is the gravitational field. All the fields are the bulk. So it's not a, it's not a, again, a master field is not, it's not a naive uh, A mu configuration. But you have to think of it as some configuration of uh, the bulk fields. Yeah, high dimension. High dimension, five dimension, yeah. So, so if you give me, if I, if I give you a contour C. That's right, uh, yeah. Then there is, a, there is a variational principle that tells me what is the, yeah, the minimal, the minimal area. You minimize the area. In that space. In that space. But with this metric. So if it were flat space, then that will be just. Yeah, space. that's right. Yeah. In fact, because it's uh, ADS, uh, this length doesn't cost much. It's just, there's a scale in it. So, so I now what? I, so this is a qualitative idea. I'll just make the conjecture precise. Uh, So the claim is, so you have some bulk. So this is, well, use the same picture. So you have some fields here, which are the bulk fields, which I'll generically call phi. So this would include g mu nu, which is the gravitational field, and uh, maybe some, some phi, which is the dilaton. So whatever the gravity theory is, OK? And the gravity theory, uh, how you get that gravity theory will the action for G mu is usually the Einstein action. And then you will have extra terms. And these are usually obtained from string theory via supergravity. Okay, so there's some theory here. And the theory here, to be precise, uh, is say type 2B string theory or supergravity. So this has a well defined action, and you can calculate classically on this. This is the bulk. And on the boundary, you have that theory, n equals 4 supersymmetric angles. And the way the conjecture is stated is that you solve the wave equation for, you, you, solve, you do the functional integral. Imagine doing the functional integral over the fields in the bulk. So I'll generate by, so these are the bulk fields with some action in the bulk. That's this action, so I'll call that S5. And 
when you do, so this will depend on the boundary values. So you have, it's a boundary value. Uh, you have to define the, there's a boundary here. This is a boundary, uh, let's say, it. so this is r going to infinity. So when you do the functional integral, you have to specify some boundary conditions for your fields. And you specify that boundary condition, so phi at r equals infinity. And let's say these are the uh, Minkowski coordinates. There's some phi naught. So you specify that. So when you do this integral, you'll get some functional of the phi naughts. Because you've integrated, so it depends on that. So this is some function of the phi naught, which is the values of the, the graviton, et cetera, at the boundary. The claim is that this is equal to the following functional integral. So I'll denote by A mu the fields in the bulk. plus phi naught times, so, so there are many phi, so I put an index i here. So this is the statement of the conjecture. So in the boundary, these are acting as sources for these, these operators of the Yangle's theory. So why is it doing some Yeah. The gauge invariant operators. So gauge invariant operators. Okay, so that's the precise statement of the conjecture. Uh, so now you can, if you, and this is a functional integral, but in many situations you can do the saddle point and just plug in the classical solution. So this guy you can approximate by. Well, if I classical solves the equations of motion of that with that boundary condition. Okay, so if you, so this functional integral is approximated by that. So, so this A alone, there are also Fermi and so on. There are ah, everything. Yeah. This is from the fully supersymmetric. So here it's super gravity. Then what can, we could have formally demanded this k-gravity. <laughs> saying that perhaps it's something interested in those Uh Yeah, but why, well, I mean, right. Uh, you mean this should be equal to that? Yeah. No, but. I guess what I'm saying is that this thing is equal to it. Yeah. Is there any meaning to demanding this something? Oh, you can do that, uh, except you might get into trouble when you start doing quantum corrections on the gravity side. Because this is, OK, you, you can just demand that the classical theory should be equal to that theory. Mm -hmm. uh, this, so that would be a different conjecture, yeah. Well, it's in the sense it's not been rigorously proved. Lots of checks and people believe it's true, but it's still not a rigorously, people have shown that it's equal. I mean, people are, yeah, everything matches. So when the, when the gravity is easy, the gauge theory side is strong level. Yeah, so I, in fact, I, I, right, so the, 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 now of course the parameters here are G and uh, G angles and N. Um, so you, uh, as uh, Toof did, you can replace that by n and uh, g squared Yang Mills times n, which he called lambda. That's the way the calculations are done on the boundary. Here, the parameters are this. I haven't put a scale here, but ADS comes with a scale because there's a cosmological constant. So the scale of the curvature here, which I've set to one, which we'll probably put in some units, put some r squared by r squared. So um, the connection is G and, and here the parameters are R, ADS, and G string. Okay. So the connection is G squared, uh, G yang mills are is uh, basically R fourth by, I think that's right. Oh, wait, is that right? Yeah, powers, I hope I got the powers right. Yeah, G squared, right, yeah. So this is the, the map between the parameters on the two sides. So G S is the string coupling. This is the scale of the ADS scale by uh, string scale. So notice that um, if this number is large, 
then the curvature on this side is small. So, smoothly varying geometry. If it is a smoothly varying geometry, you can approximate it by you do not need to worry about all the string modes, you can approximate it by supergravity. The massive modes do not play a role. So, um, conversely, if you want to trust this as a supergravity, you will use a gravity approximation, this number must be large. So, that is like saying the your Yang Mills has to be strongly coupled, it is a strong coupling. Okay. And uh, if you want the string coupling to be weak, <coughs> so if you fix this, if you want this to be small, n has to be large. So, large n and uh, large g squared Yang Mills n and weak, so we want small g s uh, and large r. If these two are satisfied, uh, you can do classical gravity. If, uh, if, if this is violated, you have to do quantum gravity. If this is violated, you have to include the string modes. So, the regime in which this works well <coughs> is where uh, this number is large, which means your field theory is strongly coupled and, uh, uh, you, and n is large. Okay. So, that is the reason why it is hard to verify. You can calculate something very easily on this side, like many dualities, but the corresponding quantity on the boundary is often hard to calculate because this has to be a large number, otherwise it is not reliable. Okay. So, strongly coupled field theories are easier to do than weakly coupled field theories. Ah, so, yeah, actually I did not mention the word CFT, but this theory. So, le so, let me say a little bit about the CFT angle. So, a, now ADS 5 has a, a isometry SO 4 comma 2, this is the isometry. Isometry, isometry means it leaves the space invariant. You, you do SO 4 2 rotations, the bulk gravity geometry looks the same. If you, you can describe ADS by, a, uh, by an equation as a hypersurface equation and it will be invariant under this if you want I can. So, but this is also the conformal group of Minkowski space. So, uh, symmetries on this side, if it has to be a symmetry on that, you must have a theory with a conformal symmetry. So, the boundary field theory has to be conformal. So, that is why it is an ADS CFT. So, as soon as you have an ADS, you have a CFT and vice versa. Now, uh, this was a very specific connection between uh, M4 and ADS5, but you can do this more generally for ADS d plus 1 and uh, d dimensional theory on the boundary. You can, uh, if people have worked Euclidean versions of it, you can work in Euclidean space. Um, so, that is the uh, basic idea of ADS CFT in any dimension. You have an ADS uh, d plus 1 and a Minkowski d, there is a corresponding gravity theory, usually super gravity theory and some CFT. Okay. If you if you want the whole thing to come out of the string theory, then there are very specific gravity theories you can use. But people have been more liberal and worked with uh, general gravity theories in ADS in the hope that uh, since you're doing you're not doing quantum corrections anyway, and you just need the classical result, maybe that's okay. You don't need the string theory embedding. So, so then people have generalized and uh, applied it in various dimensions with various uh, bulk theories. And I should point out that in, in general, what is the dual of a bulk theory on the boundary is not known. In this case, in this case it is known exactly. But in, in, if I give you a general gravity theory, the only thing I can say is that this is a conformal field theory with some, uh, in some dimension and some generic properties of the symmetries you can match. But if you ask me what is the CFT in the boundary, I do not know. In general, you do not know. Yes, yes. So, I think, yeah, I think the equivalent of n would be the central charge. And uh, central charge counting the number of degrees of freedom, yeah. The equivalent of n would be the central. So, you, you would expect this to work when you have large central charge. Uh, and, yeah, then uh, whatever the, so the, what, in the conformal field theory, uh, this, the coupling, large coupling usually means large anomalous dimensions. So, if your normal dimensions are large, then 
that would be the equivalent of large uh, coupling constant here. So in those situations, uh, you would expect this to map to a classical gravity problem. <coughs> Yeah, so uh, these are the operators of the CFT and they have well defined and so you, you can choose them. So, so corresponding to every field in the bulk, there will be some operator in the CFT and there is a well defined uh, connection. So for instance, if you have a scalar field, you can relate the mass of the scalar field in the bulk to the dimension of this operator in the boundary in specific cases, yeah. So there is a map. and. So those things, once you know the CFT, those things can be worked out. Yeah. Yes. Is it possible to play with it and bring wave function? Ah. Yeah, I think. Yeah. So here, okay. Steve will probably say something about that. But here, what what you what you what you can say is that. Um, if you, if I give you the x, if I, if I solve the wave equation, and I know how one of these fields uh, behaves at the boundary, boundary behavior, then I can get from that the expectation value of the operators in that state. Right. So, so what, that would be a vacuum state. That would be the expectation value of the operators right. in the ground state. That's but to actually to construct. And yeah, that uh, I don't know if anyone has done that. Yeah, that's that's good. Good. Is this not the wave functional? Uh, this one. This. No, these are like sources. It's like Z of J. These are like sources for the boundary theory. So I want the wave functional in terms of A mu. So finally, that is what you want. Yes. Now you you finally want the wave function in terms of the uh, A or the gauge invariant fields on the A. Then C D. That's right. Uh, yeah, that. Uh, right, I don't think people have, as far as I know, people have not addressed this. Is there anyone who knows? Yeah, but no one, I, I don't know if people explicitly construct wave functions. So to say, I mean, you can, so there are some issues where, so when you solve the wave equation in the bulk, you get solutions which are normalizable and you get solutions which are non normalizable. And the non-normalizable ones are the ones that correspond to these sources, and the, the value of the infinity. And the normalizable ones are supposed to correspond to uh, changing the state of your CFT. So but the statements are sort of indirect. I mean, there's no explicit construction of a wave function. Um, okay, so this is the general thing. Now you, you can apply this in one plus one boundary theory. In the bulk theory, you'll get an ADS three. Um, and you can do this at finite temperature, for instance. Finite temperature on the field theory means finite temperature in the bulk. And um, typically, if you have finite temperature in the bulk, the classical solution is not simple ADS, but ADS with a black hole. So then you're calculating uh, quantities in a black hole background, ADS black hole background. So those calculations have been done. So people have calculated CFTs in 1 plus 1, calculated Green's functions explicitly. Uh, on both sides and checked it, for instance, for ADS3 and there are papers on that. So for ADS3, which is CFT 1 plus 1, you can explicitly compare uh, Green's functions, finite temperature, and people have calculated it. Here there's something called the BTZ black hole. So you can calculate the Green's functions from the bulk. And it matches very well. So those things have been done. Um, so I don't know what uh, else. So yeah, so now the, the only thing I can add is to say that this, uh, because it's of the form dr by r, the scale as you move, as you, if you move this Minkowski space in the radial direction, you're scaling it by r. So if you imagine having a, a finite cutoff of a fixed size in your um, space, then as you uh, bring it inward, your size is getting smaller relative to that cutoff. So effectively, you're, uh, you're going to the infrared. If you go outward, relative to your size, the cutoff is very small. So that's like the continuum limit. Okay. So as you move in the radial direction, so you can imagine evolving this. You can, instead of putting the plane at r equals infinity, you can put it at a finite value. 
that would correspond to a scale transformation. And people have shown, at least in some leading order, that if you that uh, the RG flow from this sheet to this sheet can be reproduced by studying the uh, how the, the, the bulk modes uh, change from here to here. So you see how the bulk modes change from here to here. That will tell you the change in the change in the expectation value of that operators, and that will uh, that reproduces the RG flow that you expect from the boundary theory. So there's a connection between the RG flow uh, of this theory and radial direction because R is like a scale. So that's why the, there's this whole business about the renormalization group being like a radial evolution, and ADS is very natural for that because R comes like a scale. So if you, in other words, if you change variables and write this as uh, some d rho, dr by r is d rho squared, then this will be of the form e to the power of rho. So you can see that translations in rho are scale transformations. So you say that it's <coughs> Sorry? So you say that sometimes ADS is natural for something like this? No, ADS is natural because of the connection with the conformal group. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so uh, people have actually. Looking at the group, so yes, yes. Yeah. So, maybe it's not clear that the natural thing to look at is ADS. So it could be, you don't think a scale dimension, right? So you have to consider space. Uh, yes, you, in principle, you could. People have tried uh, DS CFT. Con uh, I don't know about that, but uh, I think. I think uh, the scale invariance is important here. It's not just RG, but it's RG. Uh, uh, that, well, you can't. <laughs> because as I said, uh, there is no, uh, we don't know how to construct a dual for a given theory. We just know that, so there's some known examples where the dual exists. Uh, if you just take a general theory in the bulk, what is the conformal dual of that? We don't know. You can, you can, so for instance, you can say these are the dimension of the operators. These are the symmetries of the operators. Uh, and then you can invoke some universality or something. And that's what Subir such does. He takes a generic 2 plus 1 theory, uh, conformal field theory, and then says t a certain behavior should be universal. And he calculates it in the bulk and get some reasonable results. But it's not, it's, never, it's not that you can start with some specific conformal field theory and calculate a construct a bulk dual and do the calculation there. Yeah, if you could do that, life would be really nice. So Dictionary in the sense, given that there is some field theory here, we don't know what it is, these are the Green's functions. There's a prescription for calculating Green's functions and higher point functions. So basically, you just, I mean, you can see if you, once you have those, I can just take functional derivatives with respect to phi naught and get Green's functions. So if you, if you know how to calculate this from this side, you can take uh, functional derivatives and just calculate Green's functions. And for specific things like the Wilson loop expectation value that I showed, uh, there are prescriptions that says this expectation, which is hard to derive from this, but it says that if you take that loop, then this minimal surface is the, is the answer. Uh, so, so, the, 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 so, the, so, so what is practice in, sorry, yeah. The area of that surface. The area of that surface. So e to the power of minus of that area will be the expectation value of the loop. So same thing for uh, two-point functions. If you take the uh, the geodesic length connecting them in many cases, that should be, yeah. Right. So, so there is the yeah, it's so, that's right. Yeah, it's the same thing. So it's a conjecture. We've shown to be true for any lower dimensional exactly solve the same thing. Well, I think things like. Um, these uh, one plus one field theories, you, you people know, where you know all the dimensions of the operators, people have calculated Green's functions and shown that it matches. And finite temperature where all the, all the operators contribute. So people have shown, if you take BTZ, you can calculate correlators exactly, and it matches. Uh, I don't know about, um, I mean, it's not, it's not that you give me a conformed field theory, I can just Give you a well, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't mean that there is a mirror image. I mean, there should be, but we don't know exactly. I don't. I don't think it's. 
known exactly what what is what would be in each case. So if you say I take the Ising model and give me, uh, well, I, I don't know. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think so. No, but why? Usually, you Because you, uh, the reason is yeah, because it's here. You the calculations are easy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So, the, uh, so for instance, this theory, this theory has uh, uh, global symmetries. Uh, in fact, it has a global symmetry SO6. This angle has an SO6 symmetry, and uh, you can trace that to some uh, local symmetry gauge symmetries on the bulk. Okay, so, um, actually, the it turns out that the way you get this ADS5 is by starting from 10 dimensions and compactifying it on an S5. So you have 10 dimensions 3 S5. And the SO6 is the isometry of this S5 that you have. That global symmetry of the angles is the isometry of this S5. And this compactification involves taking um, gauge fields in this 10 dimensional theory and, and making them non abelian, introducing a coupling constant, and you gauge it. And you'll get uh, gauge fields here. So it'll be a gauge symmetry on this side. So, okay, and uh, of course, the reverse, we don't know. If you have, what is this reflection of the gauge symmetry here in the bulk? I don't know. Because we only have gauge invariant operators in the bulk. So, the questions on what Bala. Maybe Steve. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So the glo uh, global symmetry over here becomes a gauge symmetry yes. for the gauge fields here. Right. But that says, so the global symmetry there says nothing about the gravitational uh, de so degrees of freedom on this side. Well, the gra the, the, there are gauge fields also here. So I should add there are some gauge fields here, which is independent of those gauge fields. No, right, right, right. But so for instance, this theory, there'll be some number of uh, uh, gauge fields, A mu, which will precisely be right to gauge the SO6. So there's no correspondence which this takes us from some theory into a purely gravitational. Oh, you want pure, yeah, if, you, if you have pure gravitation, you, you can just uh, by hand write down a pure gravity theory on the side, an ADS. Uh, then it won't have much content in the sense that, okay, so then the only field you have is G mu nu, and the dual of that will be the energy momentum tensor. Uh, but you won't have any handle on what uh, are the other operators. So it's, it's as if to, Probe various things. You have to try more complicated theories here. No, but that so in that simpler setting, what would a global symmetry on the CF, CFT? Ah, uh, that there wouldn't be. I mean, you wouldn't even well. You wouldn't all the only operator I you can I can think of dual to G mu is T mu nu, and there is no global symmetry for T mu nu, except for translations and things. I mean, you're, you're talking about some no, internal no, symmetry, no, internal no, symmetry, no, internal symmetry. Yeah. So for that, you would need you need something that. Uh, Transforms under that, yeah. Right, so graviton doesn't transform on anything. Right, and this is now. Uh, ah, four. Ah, Lorentz transformations are there. Is that? I think he wanted something, some internal symmetry. Yeah, no. so probably the final question, but and this is motivated by something I've read on Wikipedia. So. Ah. Let's not, yeah, let's be a bit careful there. But uh, so in 2 plus 1, if uh, a purely, uh, a, so a purely gravity theory is topological, right? You can write a churn sign. Yeah. Which is so 2 plus 1, yeah, the ADS3 you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, ADS3, yeah, you, you can write down this, uh, it's ADS3, or you can write down a, B, there's a black hole, BTC black hole is there. And that gives you some non trivial. No, no, but that is at a finite temperature. At, you, well, you could take the, if, the it, if it's charged, you can take the extremal limit with zero. So there are variations you can do on that. So if it's an uncharged BTC, it's always at finite temperature. But you could put an electric charge on it, and then you can tune it to make it zero temperature. Right. right. <laughs> so my question there was, uh, so it's a purely topological theory, and so you can write out the gravity theory as a gauge theory. And then 
Wikipedia at some point says that if I have a global internal symmetry on the boundary on my CFD, mm. that directly corresponds to the the gauge group on the gravity side. Ah, yeah, I think that's the churn simons connection. I think but uh, there's a connection between CFTs uh, on the boundary and churn simons theory in the bulk. That's a separate. Uh, 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 yeah, I think well, and I, I think it's also true that gravity can be written as a churn simon series. So I suppose it's, but that's a very specific churn simon series. It's a SU, what SU11? I think Bal knows more about it. SU11 churn simon theory yeah, for gravity. In some sense, it is more than that. The given churn simon theory on a three magnitude yeah. with boundary can be given as a CFT on, on the boundary, right? That's a that's a general statement, right? It doesn't refer to to gravity. Yeah, it doesn't refer to gravity, but in particular, gravity is an uh, example of. So, in 2 plus 1, it corresponds to that. Same that's right, yeah. So, that's in, sort of independent of the ADS CFT connection, <coughs> but there may be relations, yeah. So, is this that like saying, so if my C, uh, CFT has S U2 symmetry, is this that then saying that the connection on the, on the gravity side is valued in S U2? No, no. The, that internal symmetry will entirely in some gauge fields. Angles. The connection is the usual connection. Maybe yeah, beta connection. Yeah, you have some SU2 gauge fields. Because when you when you bring it down from um, high dimensions, you you get G mu nu this and a whole, whole bunch of other things, including gauge fields. So they form. Um, so I don't know. If maybe Steve can say something. Yeah. Or yeah. Thank you. you want. So we will come back to you with questions. Okay. Steve. Okay, so I'm just going to say a little more about uh, ESCFT and try and mention some things that uh, may be relevant for this connection with Mira. Um, <coughs> I didn't have very much time to prepare, so I'm just going to sort of go off the cuff here. So I think, and sort of connecting with uh, Mira, there are a couple important uh, things to mention about ADS-CFT. So the, the, the first thing is, uh, Bala already mentioned, which uh, was the connection between um, this extra dimension and, and scale transformations. So as, as he was saying, one of the ways you can write the metric uh, for ADS is uh, in terms of some coordinate rho, radial coordinate rho, uh, which is d rho squared plus e, uh, basically to rho by L. Um, okay. So <coughs> this shows you that, so these are going to be our coordinates on the boundary. So uh, since I was asked to work in one plus one dimensions on the boundary, that's what I wrote here. Um, so as rho goes towards infinity, it, What's that? Is that insulting <laughs> Well, actually, uh, I, I've mostly worked on ADS-3 CFT too. So um, there, there, is a, there is a known example uh, with, that is as rigorous as this n equals 4 case, um, which is ADS-3 CFT too. Although it's a very, very strange uh, CFT too. What's the name of the CFT? Uh, it's a four comma four sigma model with uh, target space, which is a uh, orbifolded, or actually a deformation of an orbifolded. Uh, it's not as simple as No. <laughs> it, 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 it's very strange. It has some very strange technology associated with it. But uh, anyway, so as as uh, rho goes towards infinity, you see that the the transverse space, the the space, these coordinates. Uh, that are of the field theory um, get scaled up. And so, as, as Paul was saying, as you um, translations in the row direction, 
uh, can be counteracted by a scale transformation uh, in, this, in, in these directions. So x goes to, the, to minus e, e to the minus a over l, um, x basically, and t similarly for t. Um, so then this tells you that <coughs> as, as rho goes towards infinity, where the boundary of ADS is, um, th this, this corresponds uh, to the UV of our theory. Uh, and small rho is going to correspond to the IR. Okay. So typically what happens when you compute correlators or you compute uh, just about anything using ADS CFT, it diverges. So what you actually have to do is you have to regularize by putting your field theory at some rho naught. Um, <clears throat> compute your geodesic or your propagator or your world sheet or what have you. Regularize by subtracting off the divergent piece and then take rho naught uh, to infinity. So rho naught is, going, is sort of the natural cutoff on ADS. It's the natural way to cut off uh, the supergravity theory. On the field theory, uh, there are many different ways you can cut off the divergence of the UV divergence of the field theory. Of course. So one way would be to put it on the lattice, which maybe is most relevant uh, here. But then you could also think about hard momentum cutoffs, dimensional regularization, and so on. Um, but it's clear that that this row knot uh, should should loosely uh, it, it is loosely playing the role of that momentum cutoff or inverse lattice spacing uh, on, the, on the CFT. So that as, um, so that the RG flow um, from the UV to the IR should correspond to integrating out uh, these bulk degrees of freedom. And so people have made various progress uh, in that direction um, in the early days of ADS CFT and, and in the past couple of years, there have been some interesting papers in that direction. Um, but really, the big, the big open question, and maybe Mara could even say something about this, is how to relate, is how to make this precise. So, how do you regularize the field theory so that it corresponds uh, to some uh, natural cutoff on the ADS or, or vice versa um, so that you can really nail down? Um, RG flow in the ADS and connect it to RG flow in the CFT. But you can still make qualitative uh, statements, or you can look at um, questions that aren't sensitive to, to exactly how you recognize it. In the multi conjecture, mm -hmm. are all these things already taken care of on the regularization? It's straightforward. Yeah, it, it, it's straightforward. And as long as you insist, as long as you uh, Regularize and then take the limit to infinity, then then you're fine. But if you want to, yeah. But if you want to, if you want to RG flow into the IR by integrating down uh, from the boundary of ADS, then it becomes less clear exactly what the relationship is between the cutoff CFT and the cutoff ADS. Okay. So I think. It directly corresponds to what? Well, it's not. It's not clear. Um, it's not clear that if I cut off the ADS in this way, that it's going to be the same as cutting off the field theory by putting it on a lattice. In fact, it's probably not. But it is clear that the cutoffs should have be related in this fashion, in terms of as you take them to infinity, uh, the two theories will agree. But. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think I think there's a qualitative agreement there, uh, but because the lattice is breaking the Lorentz symmetry in the transverse space, 
Whereas this, uh, when I put my theory at, at finite row naught, I still have the Lorentz invariance in this space. Um, I think it's fairly clear that it's not directly the same. But yeah, so it's really the big open question uh, in holographic RG flow is, is, in my opinion, understanding how these two things are related. Like RG flow right. Yes. So you can see, um, yeah, you, you you can see that if I if I take uh, so as as I move deeper into ADS, uh, transverse distances become shorter, so it becomes cheap uh, to go uh, a long distance. So if I if I look at a a correlator between widely spaced points on the boundary, uh, then it becomes sort of the cheapest option to go deep into ADS and use up my transverse distance in that way. But if I, if I probe the UV physics by taking a correlator between two closely spaced points, uh, then I'm not going to really probe the ADS very much at all. Um, and so then that's one way of looking at this uh, IR and uh, UV. Okay. So the, the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, there's a prescription, and I'm not sure uh, exactly how to connect this with Mira or anything, but uh, recently there's been a prescription or a conjecture on how to compute entanglement entropy um, on the boundary CFT using, using these holographic techniques. Okay. And actually, it's very similar. Um, to the sort of Wilson loop calculation that Balo is describing. Okay. So if I, if I take uh, the boundary of my ADS, or my CF, which is my CFT, and I want to compute the geometric entanglement entropy between of some region, okay. excuse me, then Uh, what Ryu and uh, Takianagi uh, suggested is that I should look at the minimal surface that shares uh, this boundary in, in the ADS. Okay. And then compute the, the area okay, of that minimal surface. And I put area in quotes because depending on the dimension, it, may or may not be your normal idea of area. In fact, in one plus one dimensions, it's just going to be a geodesic, okay? So it's going to be length. And then divide it by four times uh, Newton's constant in the ADS space. And the claim is that this should be uh, my entanglement entropy of this region R. Okay. So. The motivation for this um, is sort of manifold. <clears throat> so first of all, it comes naturally from the um, this Bekenstein-Hawking formula for the entropy of a black hole, where you know that the uh, entropy of a black hole is the area of the black hole horizon over 4G. Yes. So uh, that, that uh, geodesic area that you put yeah. actually depends on, uh, so you have written that as e to the row by L there. So for different CFTs that, uh, that e to the, instead of e to the row, I have some other function there. What what, what, what will determine what is the CFT? Because uh, my metric is given there. Yeah, the metric is fixed. So then the area will be the same for, for all terms. OK, yeah, actually, the, I, should, I should clarify. So. This is the metric for ADS. So really, the ADS CFT correspondence is between asymptotically ADS uh, state, asymptotically ADS states in the supergravity, and then states in the CFT. Okay. So global ADS is going to be the vacuum of my CFT. So I'll have global ADS, and then I'll have a bunch of other fields in supergravity. Uh, but if I allow myself subleading and row corrections. Um, to the metric, for instance, then indeed the, this geodesic is going to get corrected. 
uh, depending on the state and then the dimension. Let's see, in the vacuum. That's why the this problem is showing that the central charge of the probability is the curvature of this space. The curvature of the CFT will actually be greater than this space. Yeah, then then that instead of being to the row of L, there will be some gentle. Yeah, so L L here is the ADS radius, uh, which does get related, if you like, to uh, the central charge. I mean, in part, actually, so I should clarify. So this is the Newton's constant and ADS space. Okay. So in practice, uh, for instance, in the, in the ADS, CF, ADS3 CFT2 I work, have worked with, uh, it's actually ADS3 cross S3 cross T4. So then the when you compute the three-dimensional Newton's constant, the volumes of the S3 and the T4 uh, go into uh, this, this Newton's constant. So there is some dependence there. Um, but also, this should only be valid uh, at large n and, and large coupling constant when I don't have to worry about those stringy corrections. G string and, and alpha prime corrections that Paula mentioned. Okay. Because if I have, if I'm not at large n, meaning I don't, or if I don't have large anomalous dimensions, uh, then I should ha be doing quantum gravity, and then there's no sense in which I can even define a minimal area. Okay. So that it's clear this formula can't hold in that case. Um, so it may be that there's some universality uh, when I go to large anomalous dimension and uh, large coupling constant. OK. Yeah, so th this uh, conjecture by, by Ryu and Takinagi was, was motivated in part by uh, the Beckenstein-Hawking um, formula for the entropy of a black hole. Okay. And, and related to this is, is this idea that uh, the entropy bound that in any volume of space I can't ever pack more entropy than I would get by just having a black hole. Um, and so the idea is that I look for the, the minimal surface uh, that is going to extremize uh, that bound on the, the entropy and then that should be the, the geometric entanglement entropy. Okay. Um, so this passes a number of, of nice checks. It's been proven that it satisfies uh, strong subadditivity, for instance. Um, and then there's sort of another nice connection with black holes. Um, so if this is the boundary of my ADS and then I have a black hole, well, let me first consider when I don't have a black hole. OK, so here's my ADS. Uh, and then here's the boundary of ADS. This is the kind of picture we saw uh, in the talk this morning. Um, so then the, if I want to compute the entanglement entropy of some region, and that's R here, okay, and the claim is uh, if I'm looking in two dimensions, CFT2, uh, then I should look at a geodesic uh, that connects these points. Okay. And there's, um, there's only one geodesic that I can really look at. Um, and so, as you know, S of the entanglement entropy uh, in a pure state of some region and its complement uh, are equal. Okay. Whereas if I have a black hole, okay, then actually for a given boundary conditions on the, on the boundary of ADS, um, there's sort of two geodesics I can think about. So one would be this geodesic, and then another geodesic which would seem to correspond to the complement. So you know when I go to finite temperature, um, th these two things are no longer equal. Okay. And so that's observed very nicely uh, in, this, in this picture 
when I put in a black hole, then there's sort of two uh, minimal surfaces that I can consider. Okay. And moreover, you see that as I make this uh, separation smaller, um, basically, the, the, or what you can see is the difference between these two all is going to be come from the area of the event horizon, and then it connects very naturally uh, with this Bekenstein-Hawking formula um, for the entropy of a black hole. Not sure whether there was anything else I wanted to emphasize. Yeah, so as, as Barlow said, um, for this two-dimensional case, uh, you can compute things uh, exactly on both sides, and, and they have the right scaling, and they uh, agree. For instance, this in, uh, entanglement entropy uh, passes this test in two dimensions. Um, right, so maybe I'll say one, one last thing is that uh, when you compute this geodesic length, what you get is something like C by 3 uh, log L over A, okay? Where A now is, is basically, uh, I guess, 1 over rho naught. Yeah. So A gets related to my UV cutoff because, again, <coughs> excuse me, things diverge uh, as, I, as I go to the boundary of ADS. So when I try and compute this geodesic length, uh, as I take rho to infinity, uh, that length diverges, so I regularize by putting in my cutoff. Uh, but that corresponds very nicely uh, to the result I know for 2D CFTs, for instance, using techniques by like Cardi, uh, where I get exactly uh, that scaling. But the A is the lattice or other UV cutoff. The exact expression L is the separation. Oh, yeah. A is the cutoff, lattice spacing, if you like, or. One over, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So if you compute the length of the geodesic in ADS three, then this is exactly what I get. And also the finite temperature result agrees uh, between the CFT and the. over four G Newton. So G Newton gets related to the central charge. So that's where the central charge comes from. So uh, uh, unless there are questions, I don't think I have anything else on top of my head to say. So I think I'm trying to think. So um, like what Polchinski and there's some work about uh, doing uh, evolution of the wave function, uh, renormalization, holographic renormalization of the wave function. So. There are, I mean, there's been work on uh, normal, uh, the RG flow of entanglement entropy, uh, where you take some asymptotically ADS geometry, and then you compute the, use, use this holographic prescription for computing entanglement entropy and see how it changes as it probes deeper uh, into the ADS. And then there's Polchinski's work, recent work on Wilsonian RG, Wilsonian holographic RG. Uh, where they, I mean, if you cut open the path integral, then you end up getting a wave functional. And so I think you can do things related to that. Um, and I think there are things sort of close to that in what Polchinski did and uh, what Verlinde, Verlinde, and DeBoer did. But 
Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Basically, if you put boundary <laughs> conditions on the path integral, then that those becomes a functional, uh, and then becomes your wave functional. Yeah. Um, and so when you do this RG flow, uh, it comes out very naturally that you end up wanting to put sort of different boundary conditions on the path integral. So I think it may be sort of close, but I I don't know if anyone's looked at it directly. famous conjecture is proved true. Mm -hmm. Does it uh, help us to solve strong coupling problem, other strong coupling problem? Well, so by this conjecture, you mean? The, the famous Maldesena conjecture. Well, so, so the, at true. this point, there are many generalizations. So if you mean specifically n equals 4 super right. yang mills, uh, if that's proven, then does it help you in condensed matter? Is that your question? Or even for stick, like I mean, physically, will they be able to solve QCD problems? I mean, certainly people have tried. Because, I mean, n equals 4 super Yang mills is not exactly QCD. So, for instance, it's conformal and uh, QCD is not. So, it, I, I mean, the real power in ADS CFT comes from the fact that uh, you can do. Uh, but only in that corner. That power is, seems to be there in a supersymmetric corner. Well, the, the, what I was saying, is, what I was going to say, is that the, the power comes from the fact that you can you can really deform it. So you can, so people try and com compute things for related to QCD. Uh, you can kill off some of the snoozy. You can uh, put in relevant deformations of the CFT, um, and it still seems to hold up. So. Then you come down all the way from coming to Hubbard model. <laughs> I think you know Subir Shastra would love to, but. Hubbard model is not relativistic. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Not relativistic approximation. That kind of non-relativistic approximation can then actually basically. Yes, I mean, so okay, so for for this, I mean, I think people expect that some version of this should hold. For any basically any ADS um, and any CFT that has large anomalous dimensions and um, is strongly coupled in some sense should have some ADS dual description uh, is is the expectation. But so uh, to connect directly up with you know your favorite field theory uh, is probably a long ways off. Strong interaction physics. Yeah. No, no. I mean. So how does it help? No, first of all, first of all, there are two ingredients ready to What is the carrier that is supposed to be on the ball? What is the carrier that is supposed to be on the bone? And then the conjecture is ready to be. So the conjecture itself is not going to tell you that if you say that you want Hubbard model on the boundary, somebody has to tell you now what is it supposed to be on the dual to. So there is a message in the conjecture. I mean, that's what I see. That in general, strong coupling problem could be solved. Yeah. Yeah. That, so the, is it? That's what I'm trying. Yeah. That's the, that's so. 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 So.
it was already this Wilson book or something like a zigzag plot, etc., which was called, was called zigzag plot. And it turned out that what they called zigzag plot actually turns out to be this uh, poor game to say this book. I mean, I mean, it may be that the cases where you can easily prove the correspondence that it's not that useful or interesting, but um, yeah, I mean, certainly it's you know people have tried to take lessons from this uh, for strongly coupled physics at RIC. Uh, at people have tried to say things about superconductors and um, and various other condensed matter systems, but I'll, I'll leave. It to the audience to judge how convincing it is. But, yeah. In fact, there the opinion is strongly divided. The proponents believe it, the rest do not. <laughs> right. With respect to item physics. Yeah. Okay, Shana, I can. No, no, except for the proponents, nobody, not many people believe it. This understanding item physics, superconductors, using normal state physics, using ADS safety correspondence. No, no, I see it. Right. All, I mean, all you can read off from the from a generic ADS is is like the dimensions of operators, the charges of operators, the symmetries of the theory, and so on. But on, on, on this, on this not, I mean, I, can, can I, if I look at the equation that you wrote on the board, that one partition function equal to another partition. Yes. So let's just I just want to understand it from an elementary point. So yes. One partition function is simply something that counts the number of states. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. so is it clear to you that the number of states on this side is equal to the number of states? In when you have infinities, yeah. oh, it's very good. Yeah, but technically there's a one point correspondence. The conjunction say there's a one point correspondence in the case here. The case here. There is. Yeah. So conjunction in QCE, 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 But uh, yeah, I mean, people have counted certain subsectors like BPS sectors and so on, and then there are degrees, uh, supersymmetric sectors, if you like. No, but this is true at all temperatures, right? Like the partition function is at all temperatures. Yes, yeah. yeah. So there could be some. So the covers should be the same. Right? That that's correct, yeah. But and, and it's even stronger than that because you can put in arbitrary sources. Yeah, it's a partition function with source, with source, which can be many. They were space time point. So you can compute any correlator. So source is a trick to get these functions. But a zero source there is no. You can't extract any. Yeah. So I think this uh, for this connection between Mira and uh, CFTs. So in the way that Suki made that network and a circle, that means all those tensors in the bulk have to somehow represent these matter fields in the background of ADS CFT. So, the bulk field, there'll be a rain equation evolving it in this background. And yeah. that evolution operator seems like a stencil. Yeah, that I guess. Only thing is, I'm not able to see what is the field. Because this, uh, what is getting evolved, like in that quantum circuit model, is the many body state. Whereas in some sense, in the ADS-CFT, we solve for yeah, these yeah. operators. Uh, those, those correspond to expectation values in that background, in that wave function. Expectation values of fields uh, in the background. But of what, what is the field in this? Oh, whatever is equal to. So if you, if no, you no, talk about that, you talk about it. I'm asking you from data. In the bulk, the field is 
So I think it's very clear more connections needs to be established. This whole thing is just a tip of an iceberg. I mean, I'm really fascinated by this. So this is one way to understand quantum gravity through Mera. So I find it easy for that. Okay. If uh, there are no more questions. Thank Bala, Steve, and Sukhi for this, making this possible. So, <laughs> so now it's my present duty to hand it over to Shankar, who will thank you know, the people who have helped us, and also we will formally close it. And we make, if there are any announcements about your departure. So, so, so it's a pleasure to thank our uh, people from our administration, uh, Vishnu Prasad and K.P. Shankaran, people who looked after the uh, accommodation, and the drivers uh, and Pamban Travels who did the cab, uh, this thing, entire administration, and also the student volunteers who help us. So a special thanks to P.V. Shilakshmi who's up there, who did a huge amount of the work and to make this possible. So I think that's all, and maybe and we have to thank our you know, friends uh, who helped in protecting and taking care of sound. That's right, the video photography of the whole thing, <laughs> <laughs> and the systems people uh, who helped us. In fact, who helped us do the uh, Skype talk, which I, I think uh, it was sort of last-minute thing, but finally it worked out quite well. And I think Mangal Pandey probably requires a lot of uh, thanks for that. So thank you. So I have a bunch of back. So uh, let me also, on behalf of all the people who came from outside, uh, thank Bhaskaran, Shankar, and all the other people. This has been a really wonderful uh, meeting for us. Uh, thanks to all the speakers uh, who came from far and uh, gave us uh, lots of insights. So thank you very much, Bhaskaran. We hope that you will continue to keep organizing these. And these have been really useful meetings. Uh, I myself know that I have gotten into fields because of these meetings. So I, I think this will be one of the fields I'll get into, for example. So, so please continue this process. Thank you.